Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to our Science in the Quran series. Today, inshallah, we're going to be talking about embryology in the Quran. And by now, you know the approach. Sometimes we'll look at some verses and we'll say, Subhanallah, this is a miracle. Other times we'll look at verses that talk about nature but don't make a very specific statement. And what we're doing by talking about the science is reaching a deeper appreciation of those verses rather than in any sense trying to it really is tough for Allah validate the Quran. We are coming at this as people who are already believers in the Quran and really trying to deepen our appreciation. Thirdly, sometimes we'll just talk about generalities, philosophical issues, laws of nature that may not even relate to a specific verse, but just give us an overall better education and appreciation about the majesty and the subtlety with which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this universe. However, the verses about embryology are probably in that quote-unquote miracle verse category. And I'd like to start this session with a quote from Professor Keith Moore, Professor of Anatomy and Associate Dean of Basic Sciences, now retired, Professor Emeritus, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. For those in the medical field, you will already be very familiar with Professor Moore because his anatomy and embryology textbooks are probably the most widely used out there. I know I certainly used them when I was a medical student. And Professor Moore said, quote, it has been a great pleasure for me to help clarify statements in the Quran about human development. It is clear to me that these statements must have come to Muhammad from God or Allah because most of this knowledge was not discovered until many centuries later. This proves to me that Muhammad must have been a messenger of God or Allah. Now, this statement attributed to Professor Moore uh, in multiple sources on the web uh, is quite a phenomenal statement. And our task will be to see why Professor Moore would say this as a scholar of anatomy and of embryology, but as a non-Muslim. What is it about the Quran and embryology that captivated him so? So let's begin with verses 13 and 14 from Surah Al-Mu'minun. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ثم جعلناه نطفة في قرار مكين Then we placed him as a drop of sperm in a place of rest firmly fixed. And so this is now talking about the beginning of the human being, the beginning of embryogenesis. ثم خلقنا النطفة علقة فخلقنا العلقة مضغة فخلقنا المضغة عظاما فكسونا العظام لحما ثم أنشأناه خلقا آخر فتبارك الله أحسن الخالقين. Then we made the sperm into a clot of congealed blood. Then of that clot we made a fetus lump. Then we made out of that lump bones and clothed the bones with flesh. Then we developed out of it another creature. So blessed be Allah, the best to create. Now we will talk about this verse, verse 14, in small bits and pieces, and also talk about how modern science has changed our interpretation, how the English translation, and probably the way the, of course, ancient Arabs understood it, would now be radically changed by what we have learned in the realm of embryology. So let's take the first part of the verse. ثُمَّ خَلَقْنَا النُطْفَةَ عَلَقَةً we have made the sperm into a clot of congealed blood. Alaqa does not really mean a blood clot. Alaqa has a primary meaning of something which hangs down, something which dangles. A secondary meaning is something which leeches, the way a leech will leech blood. And so if we look very shortly after implantation, of the embryo in the uterus after fertilization in the fallopian tube and travel of the zygote and then implantation into the uterus where we have a stage of embryogenesis known as the blastocyst stage. We see that this blastocyst is hanging down from a stalk 
from the endometrial wall, from the blood-lined wall of the uterus. Here is a different depiction of it, where placental membranes, umbilical cord, etc. have not yet developed, and this microscopic ball of cells is leaching its blood supply from the endometrial wall of the mother. And so now we would interpret alaqa in a completely different way using its primary meaning, which is something which hangs, or its secondary meaning, something which leeches, the way a leech leeches blood, rather than really a completely tertiary meaning, which is a clot of congealed blood, because that probably was the best that translators at the time could do and the best people could understand in the year 700. These truths that we are looking at were not revealed until well after the invention of the microscope. Then what happens to the th this alaqa? The verse continues, فَخَلَقْنَا الْعَلَقَةَ مُضْغَةً فَخَلَقْنَا الْمُضْغَةَ عِظَامًا Then out of that clot, which we now know is not a clot, but alaqa, something which dangles, we made a fetus lump. Then we made out of that lump bones. So this is a continuation again of verse 14 of Surah 23, Surah Al-Mu'minun. But again, the primary meaning of mudgha is something which is chewed, a chewed lump of flesh. So now look at the embryo, how it develops at about four weeks. This is what it looks like. This is what is known as a somite embryo. And these ridges, which look like teeth marks, are known as somites. And here's a comparison, a chewed piece of gum with the teeth marks, to see how the somite embryo looks very much like a mudra, i.e. something which has been chewed, a chewed lump of flesh. And it is indeed from these somites that the mesodermal structures, the cartilage that turns into bone and the muscle emerge. So indeed, the mudra does become the uh, basis of the skeleton of the embryo. Now, very importantly, the actual size of the embryo at this stage is about like this. It is three to five millimeters. It would be like a grain of rice. And it would have been absolutely impossible for somebody in the seventh century, or even in the 15th century, to have seen it because if the embryo is expelled, it will be expelled with a lot of blood, to pick it out and to see the somite ridges on it, that did not happen until the development of the microscope by Leeuwenhoek in the 17th century, and it was really much better characterized later than the 17th century. And so now we would translate mudra not as a fetus lump, but as a somite embryo. So now let's look at the, the bits together. ثُمَّ خَلَقْنَا النُّطْفَةَ عَلَقَةً فَخَلَقْنَا الْعَلَقَةَ مُضْغَةً فَخَلَقْنَا الْمُضْغَةَ عِظَامًا فَكَسَوْنَا الْعِظَامَ لَحْمًا I would like to stop here at this point and go directly to a wonderful article that was written by Dr. Keith Moore that was published in the Journal of the Islamic Medical Association in 1986 and the title of the article was A Scientist's Interpretation of References to Embryology in the Quran. And from here on out, I'm going to pretty much let Professor Moore do the heavy lifting for me. I will just quote from this article with a few clarifications here and there, because he has done such a wonderful job, and because he is a recognized international expert in embryology, and because he is a non-Muslim scholar who has no preconceived bias toward the truth of the Qur'an. So what does he say? So I'm quoting directly from this article now. The Arabic word mudra means chewed substance or chewed lump. Toward the end of the fourth week, the human embryo looks somewhat like a chewed lump of flesh. The chewed appearance results from the somites, which resemble teeth marks. The somites represent the beginnings or primordia of the vertebrae. 
Then Professor Moore quotes in his article the part of the verse that فَخَلَقْنَا الْمُضَاطَ عِظَامًا فَكَسَوْنَا الْعِظَامَ لَحْمًا Then we made out of the chewed lump bones and clothed the bones in flesh. This is his translation. Then he says this continuation of Surah 2314 uh, indicates that out of the chewed lump stage, bones and muscles form. This is in accordance with embryological development. First, the bones form as cartilage models, and then the muscles' flesh develop around them from the somatic mesoderm. The mesoderm is the structure, uh, the cell types in the embryo that give rise to the bones and the muscles. And so we now get a sense of Number one, the miracle of the verses about embryology in the Quran. And number two, why Professor Moore was so intrigued. We will continue, inshallah, with one more lecture about embryology in the Quran so that we can finish up a few more observations, both about verse 14 and about some of the other verses. And I will continue quoting from Dr. Moore's article. Assalamu alaikum and see you next time inshallah.